Hi there, and welcome to the eighth of eight webinars being hosted by the National Pre-K through Third Grade Working Group. Um, I'm Christy Cowers with the University of Washington, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And we're very pleased to have, yet again, a fantastic group of presenters. Um, we are um, recording this webinar, and it will be available on the Pre-K through Third Grade National Working Group's website. Um, we will provide that web address for you in just a few moments. There are a few ways that you as the audience um, that you can engage in this webinar. If you have questions for any of the speakers or a general question that you would like um, all of the speakers to address, you can pose that through the question box, which is on the right-hand side of your screen in the control panel. We will be monitoring those questions and answering as many of them as we can throughout the webinar. Uh, the webinar is also being tweeted by Lisa Guernsey at the New America Foundation, so you can follow us on Twitter at hashtag pre-K third. And then at the end of this webinar, we have a series of polling questions that we hope you will stick around to answer, mostly because, as I mentioned, this is the last of our webinar series, and we are trying to figure out what we do next. Um, in terms of providing good information on pre-K through third to the field. So at the end of this webinar, you will have a chance via polling questions to chime in on what you would like to see come out of the pre-K through third grade national work group. Um, as I mentioned, this is the last webinar, part of an eight-part series. There is the web address. We will provide it again at the end of the webinar where you can find the full series, both recordings and the slide deck. Uh, today's focus, though, is on strategies to achieve scale and sustainability of these pre-K through third grade approaches. So with so much good work happening in districts, communities, and states, how can we ensure that what we're doing today will still be here tomorrow and next year and further into the future? So we've structured this webinar for you to think, uh, to provide you information and to have you think um, about three sort of broad categories of, um, of issues. First is to set some context for how to even think about scale and sustainability. We use those words often, but what is it really that we're trying to achieve? And then we're going to have a series of perspectives that are going to talk about strategies they have employed at the district the community, the regional, the state, and at the federal level to address scale and sustainability. And then we'll talk about some of the immediate policy implications for this work uh, in today's context. So this is in the order of um, speakers. You will hear from today me, Christy Cowers, uh, at the University of Washington. And then you will hear from Lynn Leahy, who is um, the, a curriculum specialist in early childhood education with Everett Public Schools in Washington State. And her partner in crime, Kimberly Kinzer, who is the director of early learning, pre-K through fifth grade at Seattle Public Schools. They are part of a three district coalition focused on P3 work. Then you'll hear from Vincent Costanza, who is an early childhood program specialist with the New Jersey Department of Education. And then finally, you will hear from Jacqueline Jones, who has recently left her post as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Learning at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, I do want to note that Vincent is the only one who does not have an alliterative name <laughs> presenting today. We have KKs, LLs, and JJs. Um, and so Vincent is a little left out on this one. So I'm going to start with just some broad context in terms of thinking about scale and sustainability of uh, pre-K through third work, but really this is applicable to any kind of comprehensive and collaborative work that you are engaged in. Most often we think about scale as being related to spread. In other words, how can we take something that is good and working well at a small level and 
spread it so that it reaches a larger population of children or reaches, stretches across um, a geographic region. So how can we take something and spread it to um, more people? In our case, more children and more families. That is one important dimension of spread or of scale, but we also should really be considering the spread of ideas, beliefs, values, and principles that support this work. Pre-K through third grade approaches are really new think, and so it's not the same as just um, extending, a, for example, a vaccination program. Really what we're also thinking about is spreading new ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of working together, and new ways of transforming systems. So when we think about scale, we need to be thinking about spread in all of those different ways. Other dimensions of scale that we should be thinking about include the depth of our work. So while we might be really busy doing a lot of meetings and having a lot of collaborative conversations, we really need to be thinking about whether or not that work is trickling down and truly impacting change at the level of practice. So we need to be thinking about are our system reform efforts really creating the change that we want to see in classrooms and in programs where young children are being served every day. Another dimension of scale to think about is are we creating shifts in ownership of this work? So rather than just having one office or one person or one agency really be responsible for maintaining the collaborative work, are we seeing ownership taken to scale where multiple people and multiple organizations are taking responsibility for maintaining the work? And then finally, we need to be thinking about sustainability in terms of financial stability. So while we might have short-term grant funds or short-term infusions of private dollars, are we thinking about ways to build in financial stability so that the work can continue over time when those short-term, time-limited pots of money go away? So I think it's really important as we think about scale and sustainability to think across these different dimensions. And there are, I think, um, these are my three Ps, I think there are three tools to achieve scale. And you're going to hear about these in different combinations um, from each of our next speakers. In order to achieve scale, there's really three primary tools. The first is partnership, is finding other people to do this work with um, and to undertake the collaborative effort um, together with. The second is to focus on professional development. And this is really in thinking about how are we providing learning opportunities for key people in the system so that we can begin to create common knowledge, shared vocabulary, really a deep understanding of each other's motivations for being in this work. So how are we creating some common um, some common understandings of why this work is important that then guides um, our activities. And then third and finally is a focus on policies, is how can we be putting in place policies, standards, rules, regulations, and other policy mechanisms that help to instantiate this work um, beyond the human beings um, involved. So if we were all to retire tomorrow, there would be a legacy left behind us that would continue to work. So as I said, those are my three Ps um, that I think are most crucial to achieving scale. And with that, we're going to now turn it over to the um, rest of the speakers who are really going to bring to life how they have embodied uh, this work. Um, our first speakers are going to be Lynn Leahy and Kimberly Kinzer from the uh, Pre-K through Third Cross District Coalition here in Washington State. So Kimberly and Lynn, it's all yours. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, our other counterpart, Ann Arnold, notes the alliteration there, couldn't be here today, so we're excited um, to be part of this. Um, I want to say that the coalition has been um, such an exciting um, group to be a part of. 
we oftentimes in school districts operate in silos. And we don't think necessarily that any other school district has as much going on as we do. And the idea behind coming together was how do we um, think outside the box and how do we as a group of school districts, three school districts, do our best to serve children better? Not in the same way, but serve children better. So as you can see, we have quite a few kids up and down the I-5 corridor that we're working with. And we thought if we could put our heads together and learn from each other what we're doing and leverage those things, we might actually have an impact not only on our own districts, but maybe on the region and the state. Um, when we got together um, about a year and a half ago, we talked about some of the things we were hoping to influence. And uh, first and foremost, of course, was that students were better prepared for kindergarten, first, second, and third grades. I know Christy talks a lot about the horizontal and the vertical alignment, and that's something that we have found in the coalition is something we have to be really intentional about. It just doesn't happen on its own. Um, families better connected with schools, and um, also the thing that we've talked a lot about and tried to focus on is how do we do a better job of connecting to our pre-K communities. Um, Everett and Edmonds have been a little bit ahead of the game from Seattle, and we've had the opportunity to learn from them about how they're reaching out to their partners and um, making a good connection. Um, the support uh, overall um, for a coalition, we feel like we have a lot of power together as opposed to individually. So if the three of us go to a meeting and um, have the opportunity to speak up, we can be quite bossy, and um, oftentimes uh, we have loud voices together because we, we have a common mission and we have common ideas of how we think we might be able to improve. So here are the desired impacts and outcomes, and they don't um, encompass everything that we want to do, but we're trying to stay focused and, and work on the following things. Um, of course, sustained uh, student achievement. We want to um, increase the understanding of what it means to have quality early learning and kindergarten preparedness. We talk about how all kindergartners are ready for kindergarten, but not all kindergartners are prepared. And so how do we define what that might look like, and how do we help um, folks have a common understanding of that vocabulary? Uh, because from one district to the next, or even sometimes one school to the next, we have varying opinions about how children should be coming into kindergarten. Um, we really want to work on our transitions pre-K through third. How do we ensure we have a common understanding between our um, pre-K partners, whether they be Head Start, ECAP, uh, Step Ahead, um, uh, family, friends, and neighbor? How do we make sure that we're speaking the same language when we're talking about cognitive development or social emotional development? And through this coalition, we've been able to reach out to private partnerships. We've been fortunate to have the Gates Foundation support our, our coalition and um, really give us the opportunity to reach out to other partners in the community. So we started out in 2011, and we hosted three um, meetings between 2011 and 12, where the goal was um, how do we really have effective professional development that, that principal, central office leaders, superintendents, school board members can then take back to their districts or their buildings or their area and have, a, have an understanding of why pre-K-3 matters? Um, oftentimes, the discussion in school districts is about intervention. How do we really look at prevention? How do we look at uh, starting from the absolute beginning? And of course, we know that would be uh, birth <laughs> to five, but what can we do in a district to really make sure folks understand that um, the earliest years matter? We were lucky to have um, Christy speak um, and talk about Montgomery County Schools in December, and then we were able to visit one of the schools in Seattle Public Schools, South Shore, and then um, we had uh, Linda Sullivan Dunzik and Christy speak again about the early learning framework and about the work that Bremerton's done. And then we were so lucky that we were all, as a coalition, sent to the Harvard Pre-K-3 Institute on implementation of Pre-K-3rd so that we
we really could have the opportunity to build what our theory of action is here. And I want to say that, um, that this has been, um, having leadership involved makes a big difference. Having our superintendents and our folks from the central office as well as our principals who are really in the schools and on the ground, um, having a common understanding with them about the work we want to do has been helpful. So when we got together at Harvard, um, we developed this theory of action. And um, it's really about partnership. And I think that the meetings that we had um, in 2011 and 12 really gave us the opportunity to build trust and build relationship amongst the three districts, which is key when you're doing work, so that we can be really honest about the, um, our numbers and our data and to be able to say, how do we move the needle on these things? So we said, if we bring together leaders from large districts to build depth of understanding and share the work around successful early learning programs and develop strong pre-K systems in our district, we will create sustained support for a pre-K-3 strategy to increase student achievement, increase student learning as measured by the Washington Kindergarten Inventory of Developing Skills and Interim Assessment Systems, and influence state leaders and policymakers around PK3. Walk Kids has been a huge um, central area for the coalition because all three of our districts, um, it's something we're working on and we've been required to do for our full day state funded kindergarten. And we have used that as a leverage point to not only build relationships but also look at the commonalities we have um, in order to move things forward. So this year our three areas of focus for action have been in continuing to build background knowledge about child development and pre-K-3 implementation, to focus on implementing WAC kids together, uh, focusing on the three components of WAC kids, and beginning to work together and with others in our region and state about developing a common understanding of what kindergarten preparedness is. In 2011-12, we were all uh, implementing Walk Kids or piloting it for the first time, and we found many challenges. And we realized that if we worked together on this, that we could help create a more effective and efficient way to make this transition process work. So Walk Kids is not really a test or just an assessment, but it's a way of helping uh, children and families enter, the pre into, enter into the K-12 system in a way that ensures success. So there's a focus on connecting with families, connecting and collaborating with early learning providers, and looking at children as a whole child and assessing not just their uh, readiness in terms of their letters and numbers, but looking at them globally. We, uh, so we wrote an implementation grant um, request to the Gates Foundation to support this development. Um, and part of the idea was that not only would it help us to implement this in our district classrooms, but it would help inform and influence decisions uh, in our region and in our state so that we would support a successful implementation at a wider level. And that we would do it in a way that would really benefit children and families as well as the teachers and administrators in our schools. So part of the uh, as this as part of this grant, we were really able to leverage uh, expertise and resources across districts. Uh, we from Everett, we found that we had people in our kindergarten classrooms had developed a lot of expertise on how to uh, use an observational assessment approach and to collect data on entering children. So they were able to share uh, in professional development with others. Uh, Edmonds that did a lot of work around how to do data analysis of our walk kids data and look at the how you might share that with the pre-K community. In Seattle, we were um, fortunate to have um, some literacy alignment and balanced literacy that we've been working on over the course of the last three years. And we used our balanced literacy document to go ahead and look at language and literacy on the Teaching Strategies Gold Assessment through the lens of our balanced literacy. And our hope was to make it easier for teachers to say, 
this is not something new that you have to do. This is just um, observing these skills that the students have through the lens of balanced literacy. So we took a fair amount of time um, aligning those two documents, the balanced literacy and the Walk Kids Language and Literacy, and gave that to teachers and did some professional development on that, and we invited Everett and Edmund. And then one small thing, which isn't up here, is that uh, in the beginning of Walk Kids, OSPI had done translations um, just in Spanish for their um, Introducing Me booklet. And uh, in Seattle, we felt like that was um, not enough, and so we went ahead and translated it into our top nine languages. And then I spoke to Lynn and Ann, and Ann said, uh, is there a way for you to send that to us? And I said, sure, and I just pushed the button, and there it went to both districts. So everybody, um, you know, all 85,000 children and families had the opportunity to really receive this booklet in all nine languages, which was exciting. And then the last part I'll say about this is that Edmonds had done this really wonderful jumpstart program um, in the past and shared that with um, us in Seattle. And there are various schools in Seattle who have done jumpstart in the past and done a great job, but we've never done it collectively. So we offered uh, jumpstart to um, through our grant through seven of our schools, and they did it. And we had an, an amazing amount of success with it. We had families that felt so connected to their school from the first day they walked in. And we also had principals raving about the fact that their, their kids felt really um, ready for the first day of school, that they spent a lot less time teaching behaviors that kids needed um, to sit in the classroom and things like that in September because they were able to reach out to those kids in August. So a major component of our work was uh, professional development for teachers. And by uh, leveraging our um, resources, our assessment staff, our teacher leaders, our consultants, we were able to provide more quality uh, professional development for all of our staff. And they were able to learn from each other. Throughout this year, we've also been focusing on developing the common understanding and language um, around pre-K-3. We know that principles are critical for any change that occurs, and so in November we focused on a principal institute, and in February we are planning an institute that will focus on implementation for pre-K-3 programs, in particular looking at ways different districts are using funding from their districts to provide these quality learning experiences. And so just briefly, we've had the opportunity to be a part of the um, uh, Walk Kids Advisory Work Group, lots of our teachers from the coalition and principals, and we have made a lot of suggestions. Um, OSPI in the state has been very open to our suggestions. We've been very appreciative of that, and as a result of that, one thing they've recently come up with is, is just the beginning of a common understanding, common definition of what the characteristics of children entering ki kindergarten are. And we realize that this isn't a done deal, but it begins a conversation for all of us to talk about what, what should children be bringing. And we certainly know that not all children um, will be bringing the same, that it's on a continuum, that there's a developmental continuum. But this really does begin to bring us some common vocabulary that we've all been wanting so much. So our next steps are just to continue our collaboration. We have more professional development that we're doing cross-district and at the, um, the institute that we'll be holding in February. And, and our real push is to help to um, come to an understanding about common vocabulary and definitions for um, kindergarten preparedness. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much to Lynn and Kimberly and uh, Anne, who is here in spirit but traveling today, so was unable to join them. Um, at the risk of um, being a little overly um, prescriptive, I want to just highlight what I think some of the key takeaways were from what Lynn and Kimberly just presented, especially in the context of the 
three P's of creating scale and sustainability that I talked about. Um, they've really focused on building partnership across three of the largest districts in the state of Washington. And so this not only creates sort of a bulk in terms of the number of students and families being impacted, but I also think it's created some real shared accountability. It's not just one superintendent who's going out on a limb, it's three. It's not just a handful of principals in one district, they're going into this together as principals across districts. And so I think the nice side of that is shared accountability, but having been a part of this a little bit, there's also some really constructive peer pressure. And for, when, for example, when they've hosted some of these professional development offerings, if, if they knew that two of the three superintendents were planning to come, but a third one wasn't, all of a sudden it became really important for that third superintendent to be there because he didn't want to be the only one not um, present and accounted for. So there's the partnership re approach really is not only about scale, but also some of the shared accountability. And then there's obviously deep focus on professional development and creating common language and common vocabulary, but then also sharing resources, um, sharing trainers, sharing resources, sharing space um, has really helped to create a level of scale that an individual district could not have accomplished alone. And then finally, in terms of policy change, um, as Kimberly alluded to, they're being able to accumulate lessons across multiple sites and have a louder voice in this work. So, um, for example, the uh, slide around kindergarten preparedness was really a push that came from these three districts to OSPI, which is the Washington State Department of Education. It's the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. So they really helped to loudly use their combined voices to push for some changes within the Department of Ed. So thank you very much for sharing your story, Kimberly and Lynn. Um, we're now going to turn to more of a state-level perspective and ask Vincent uh, Costanza to share his uh, perspective on his work in New Jersey. So Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, my apologies for the uh, non-alliterative name. Uh, I will point out, though, that uh, my name is the only last name from a popular 90s sitcom, so um, you know, for whatever that's worth. Um, <laughs> So the uh, uh, next slide you could go to. Um, Vincent, and if you could speak really clearly into the computer, that would be great too, thanks. Sure. Um, so, you know, first the structure. Um, here in New Jersey, we do have uh, a structure of a division of early childhood education, uh, which focuses on preschool through third grade, but has historically focused on um, our fully funded preschool uh, program. Uh, what was formerly known as our ad program, a uh, smattering of other districts, uh, preschool programs as well, but primarily that um, preschool program. Um, over the last few years, we have, um, with this uh, Division of Early Childhood Education, moved out into uh, wrapping kindergarten under our wings. Uh, but for me, there's kind of a philosophical question here, just as uh, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it really make a noise? Well, if you have this division and there's not many people there to work in it, does the work really get done that needs to get done? Uh, of course, you know, the answer is uh, you, know, you, uh, um, you do do the work uh, as best as you can, uh, but part of this is you know, about um, making, uh, really developing the partnerships um, because the work um, cannot, be done, um, cannot be done alone. Uh, but first, uh, what's the work that we have identified to get done? Next slide. So for the last few years, some of our biggest efforts within preschool through third grade and preschool to third grade alignment have involved these two initiatives. Um, the first is the preschool to third grade leadership training series, uh, which is four sessions offered regionally throughout the state. Uh, the leadership series for the last four years, which was initially funded uh, from the Foundation for Child Development, um, has a number of partners that go along with it, which I'll talk about later in uh, my presentation. Uh, the second part is this kindergarten seminar, uh, five sessions offered regionally. Uh, the kindergarten seminar has been in existence for the last two years and is designed to bring to life our kindergarten guidelines um, that we ask for pre, uh, kindergarten teachers to implement in their classrooms. 
Um, I know we're all living this with Common Core. It's one thing to have uh, standards. Uh, it's a whole other thing uh, to have people implementing them in ways that make sense to them, uh, to other people, to children, to families. Uh, so you know, in essence, this is the uh, uh, idea of the seminar, to help to actualize and make sense of our guidelines that we have uh, for teachers. Vincent, I'm sorry, this is Christy. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, so okay. um, you might need to get on top of your laptop. <laughs> I'll see if I can raise the volume, if that's any better. That's much better. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Great. So uh, first, the leadership series. Um, there, uh, for the first three years, we had uh, the components. We had a uh, uh, pre and post survey, uh, four full day sessions, which addressed topics such as program quality, child based assessment, uh, effective transition practices, uh, initially using uh, Christie's nine elements of preschool to third grade, now morphed into buckets. Uh, the important thing is uh, helping uh, leaders to identify the areas that um, they need to be thinking about with preschool to third grade. And what was kind of interesting is with our, our uh, rather prescriptive preschool program, if you ask an administrator in one of our preschool programs from one district to another, uh, they could give you a pretty solid, consistent definition of that. You know, go out and ask a principal to define their kindergarten program or their second grade program for that matter. You get for some good reasons, but you get some very different answers. The first thing we needed to do with preschool to third grade to kind of wrap our arms and help administrators wrap their arms around well, what are we talking about here. So from the administrator perspective, some things in the last few years that we've seen them work on and be very and uh, uh, be most focused on were things such as revising screening procedures, um, having surveys of where children come from when they enter kindergarten and first grade. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, you have a kindergarten registration and uh, there's you know, no idea of where kids are coming from, uh, the kind of experiences they have before they get to you, the kind of experiences that they that families have before um, they get to you. Um, yet, uh, many districts are focused on community collaboration and getting district and getting uh, family buy-in um, from a programmatic sense, but also from things such as uh, budgetarily. These are people who are voting on school budgets and often tend to be the most supportive, the ones who have the little ones coming in. Uh, so if you can identify where they're coming from, there's a better chance that um, you're going to be able to um, you know, elicit their support. Um, we've, we've also seen principals and administrators focus on uh, lesson studies and doing, putting some meat on the bones of professional learning communities on uh, center-based instruction, on uh, doing things like embedding um, specials in the kindergarten schedule to uh, reduce transitions throughout the day. Um, and as far as administrators who have attended the series, we get anywhere from superintendents, assistant superintendents, uh, elementary principals, assistant principals, supervisors, uh, but by and large, it's been attended by principals. Uh, the next um, thing that has been our next initiative that's been uh, in existence for the last two years uh, has been our kindergarten seminar. Um, offered throughout four regions in the state, uh, four to seven sessions, depending on um, uh, last year we had a, a couple of options for um, some regions, um, which is really built around the partnerships that we had. Some uh, particular regions heard about uh, the series um, and wanted to get in on it, but it was started already, so we had to make some hybrids uh, to address their needs, which we did happily. Um, so four to seven sessions. This year we do five sessions. Uh, these topics include child development, assessment, uh, appropriate environments, um, special ed, um, again, all topics that are addressed in our kindergarten guidelines, but we really may come alive in this uh, kindergarten seminar. Um, some things that we noticed from uh, teacher participation, we get a lot of, uh, you know, starting off with room arrangement. Uh, Center-based instruction is important. Well, how about we make some centers, <laughs> things like that. Um, revising schedules. Um, and adjusting screening procedures, um, certainly all uh, important elements and all things that are right there on the minds of, uh, of teachers when they, come into, um, uh, when they come into the seminar. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what I wanted to share here was a sample uh, assignment um, that actually I do with the uh, 
um, with the administrators. Um, we've done our we've had our first session for the year actually on Friday. Have um, the second session we'll, where we'll be going over with this. Um, uh, what's uh, how these some of these administrators have um, uh, started their investigations. Um, we ask the administrators number one uh, to link up with um, their kindergarten teachers. We ask them to. Um, um, sign up for the series uh, with uh, a teacher. So you have a teacher who's going to the kindergarten seminar, and then you have an administrator in this leadership series. Um, last year we noticed that our efforts seemed to be on parallel tracks, which led to teachers implementing ideas that administrators weren't ready for, or administrators advocating for changes that teachers weren't ready for. So we wanted to be much more uh, systematic and coordinated um, this year. Um, so this year teachers and administrators, as I mentioned, signed up in teams. Um, and we're asking, we ask the teachers to implement something uh, from the kindergarten guidelines, uh, either be it a uh, focus on child assessment or on um, center-based instruction or scheduling, um, and to, to come up with a plan to how they're going to address the area that they'd like to change for the year. Uh, we ask for the administrator to know about the topic that the teacher is investigating. Uh, we ask the administrator to align it with a particular preschool third grade component. Um, then we ask them to uh, think about whether uh, that one component is a feature of just a particular grade or whether it's something that they see going throughout the entire preschool to third grade continuum. So for instance, if your first grade teachers are having, um, uh, or I'm sorry, if your kindergarten teachers are having um, an issue with uh, appropriate child-based assessments. Is that something that's just with the kindergarten teachers? Do you notice that in second grade as well? Um, do you notice similar themes going throughout the grades? Uh, and then to make it relevant to the lives that administrators are, are living, they're all uh, responsible for uh, implementing uh, ISLIC standards, which are standards for administrators, supported by uh, uh, CCSSO. Um, so I ask them to identify a particular ISLIC standard that they could kind of layer on top of um, this, again, to make it more relevant to um, uh, the lives that, uh, you know, the lives that they're, um, that they're living. Uh, the next step to this is uh, actually on Friday when we, we go over this work, um, I'll ask them to uh, embed what they, what they find into a walkthrough instrument. Um, so the next step is to, okay, as you make your regular rounds, either through uh, targeted learning walks uh, or uh, in, informed by other data that they're collecting. Um, well, what does it look like when you do your walks throughout the um, uh, um, throughout your building or throughout your program? Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's plenty of work to be done. The uh, kindergarten seminar are, and the leadership series are the two areas that we focus on really within preschool to third grade alignment. Um, and the work simply cannot be done without, um, without friends and without partners. Um, here's a, a list of uh, some of the partners. Uh, it's important to highlight uh, ACNJ, uh, the grant through the Foundation for Child Development, initially came through uh, advocates for, or did come through the Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Uh, colleagues Cindy Rice and Kathy Priestley were in many ways I uh, refer to as founding mothers, if you will, of uh, some of the leadership work that we have done uh, in New Jersey. Um, and you know, we're very, we're instrumental in, in helping to, um, uh, again, uh, foster the uh, connection with FCD. Um, this year, uh, NJASCD is a new uh, player on the scene, if you will. And it's interesting how important it is. Uh, uh, it's definitely better to be loved than feared um, uh, because uh, last year, um, during uh, one of our leadership series uh, seminars, we actually had administrators who were uh, uh, sending us texts from the National ASCD conference complaining that there was no early childhood presence there, um, which led to a partnership and said, okay, well, uh, we think we could help you be part of that. Um, and this year, uh, NJASCD is a, a sponsor of, um, of our program. Um, and, you know, definitely districts. Um, in the uh, fall, uh, I conduct what I refer to as a barnstorming tour, going to all superintendent roundtable meetings, telling them, telling districts about the professional development initiatives that we had, that we have going on this year, um, and uh, you know, telling them that they should come. Uh, and here's uh, some of the uh, uh, changes that we're seeing in districts and in programs. Um, and you know, it's made some tremendous uh, uh, 
headway um, you know, throughout the state. Uh, one thing that's worth uh, noting is um, we have uh, about 76% full day kindergarten in New Jersey. Um, when I started the work uh, a few years ago, we were um, hovering around 70%, but really after these barnstorming tours going out, talking about the importance of uh, preschool to third grade alignment, the place that kindergarten plays in that, um, it's really been uh, leaders and uh, taking on uh, in district leaders, superintendents taking on um, uh, you know district initiatives to really uh, push for local leadership, uh, and you see you know examples of uh, such alignment in districts like Red Bank, New Jersey, uh, dynamic superintendent Laura Marana, uh, who really implements some of the ideas. Um, they've had full day kindergarten for a while, but you really see some of the other um, uh, pushing up or pu and pushing down, uh, as uh, Christy often talks about. Uh, but definitely, we have to highlight the districts as being important partners. Uh, so the partnership has led to increased opportunities for collaboration and, and definitely the need for translation. Um, I find that we often talk about similar topics and ideas, but use very different language. For instance, uh, the Whole Child Initiative from ASCD, which I have a link on, on right here, seems to be a good starting point in conversations about things like approaches to learning. Um, it's been my experience with um, principals and administrators throughout the state. They're familiar with the Whole Child Initiative. They're familiar with ASCD. These are um, you know, the ideas and the organizations as leaders that they're asked to live with. Um, but yet, you know, when you start talking about soft skills or not cognitive skills or approaches to learning being an important domain of development, they might not be as familiar. So to the extent that we can link ideas that are going on here, um, um, I, the more successful we, uh, we certainly will be. Um, the idea of 21st century learning, critical thinking, problem solving, many of the things that we talk about, for instance, when we talk about some of the soft skills or non-cognitive skills, uh, which you know, I guess just as an aside are one of the most inappropriate named concepts <laughs> that there can be. Uh, and I realize that I'm guilty of perpetuating that right now, but there's nothing soft about um, the skills that we uh, persist in self-control, curiosity, um, but yet um, you know, we still call them that. Um, so perhaps this will be the last time that I refer to them as that. Next slide, please. So if there's an effort to build partnerships and translate some ideas, certainly ideas into practice, into practice, but help to see people that we're often talking about the same thing, we need to think about, well, in what ways do we build bridges? Um, so integrating the seminar leadership series is certainly one approach to building bridges, uh, as is this conference that we have planned. Uh, I will say that this conference was originally planned as a kickoff conference, uh, but we had this thing in New Jersey and on the East Coast called the Superstorm, um, and uh, it is now going to be a culminating conference, which might even work out for the better. Uh, but the idea is to be more intentional about integrating the work of early childhood and traditional K-12 uh, by examining ways that we're uh, investi uh, investigating similar endeavors. Um, certainly these uh, presenters that are listed here are going to help us to do that. Where we have uh, um, Deb Leong uh, help to think about how self-regulation and executive functions um, will help uh, non-cognitive skills and influence learning in early childhood. Um, uh, Dorothy Strickland uh, will talk about uh, Common Core and how Common Core could be integrated uh, into the focus on uh, things like approaches to learning and executive function. You know, again, the very difficult thing for teachers with uh, uh, standards such as Common Core that um, uh, you know literacy of math, but yet we're going to talk to teachers about the importance of um, social emotional development, um, persistence. Uh, things that were highlighted uh, by walk kids, uh, certainly, um, but now with uh, kindergarten teachers who are going to ask to pay attention to such things as well, there's so much pressure put on them to implement literacy and math. How do we help them to do that? Um, so we need to help them to do that, and that's what this um, uh, conference is about. And then the last slide. Uh, more for me than anybody else, um, uh, although certainly helpful for others. Um, I hope, I hope as well. Um, you know, this work of uh, preschool to third grade um, involves a lot of change. Uh, and maybe 
you know, and, and I think from a leadership perspective, some very classic kind of textbook change theory um, that maybe we don't always pay attention to enough. Uh, uh, first order and second order change. Um, you know, some of these things. Um, um, you know, really ask folks to change the way that they do that they've done things from uh, for a long time. So I guess another P that I would add to to Christie's list is. Um, is being um, practical uh, as well for administrators. And I've seen this um, to help keep administrators calm through many of these hard change processes, is that when you talk to an administrator about implementing a different kind of schedule in a building or in a kindergarten classroom, that it's something that can actually be done, that it's something that there's not going to be a mutiny uh, because of uh, the change that's implemented. Um, and I think because of these things, you start to build trust in relationships with people that, you know what, um, there's a path here to implement um, this change. And that's what we're doing in New Jersey. Great. Thank you very much, Vincent. And I appreciate the, uh, both the image and your closing thoughts. So again, in summary, and as uh, a one-minute warning for Jacqueline that she'll be up next, I think some of the key takeaways um, in the three P's from Vincent's uh, portrayal of what's going on in New Jersey, again, partnership um, there instead of across districts, they're really partnering across sectors. It's state agencies partnering with advocacy organizations, partnering with professional associations, again, a really deep focus on professional development, and I think one of the really key things that's been going on in New Jersey is recognizing that even our leaders and administrators need a whole lot more than one-shot days. There really needs to be a long-term commitment um, to providing them the foundational knowledge and behaviors that they need um, in this work, and again, the importance of common language. And then finally, uh, I think some of the really groundbreaking policy changes that are going on in New Jersey, not just the way they've structured their Department of Education by having a, um, a early childhood unit that focuses on preschool through third grade, but really thinking deeply and specifically around issues related to kindergarten, for example, and then how to begin aging that up into the early grades. There have been a few questions that have come in. We're going to hold them until Jacqueline has presented. So to those of you that have asked questions, they have been noted and we'll get to them. But now we're going to move um, along and hear from Jacqueline Jones, who um, has recently uh, left her post at the U.S. Department of Education. Jacqueline. Thank you, Christy. Uh, my charge today is to very quickly go through some of the levers that policy, both federal and state policy, can be used for to, to really support and sustain this P3 effort. So the next slide give, takes a step back and just sort of gives us a look at what it is we think we're doing in P3 alignment. We really are trying to form a very smooth continuum from preschool to third grade around standards, curriculum assessments, professional development, accountability, quality governance, and probably a lot of other things, but these were the ones that struck me. Uh, and I think it's important to, to lay them out because it's complicated. It's a lot of moving pieces. I think as you listen to the work that Vincent is doing in, in New Jersey, you see that it takes a, a, a broad perspective and, and then a kind of getting into the weeds also as to how you're going, really going to do this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next, okay. At the federal level, I, I think there are some existing incentives for this work. Uh, if there is ever ESEA reauthorization, this is a huge opportunity to better align preschool efforts with the continuum to third grade. Title I, as we know, has always had uh, opportunities for preschool, but there is also opportunity to really have a kind of P3 alignment. So as you look at these existing federal policies, these, these programs really, Promise Neighborhoods, I3, uh, Stronger Head Start Collaboration, I think it's important for practitioners to put into practice a sense of how they can use these programs and use this funding to really support P3. As you, some of you may know, the Department of Education has a preschool to, uh, pardon me, a birth to third grade agenda. 
and that is absolutely perfect for, for aligning this work. So you'll see in lots of programs in education this notion of looking across that continuum. I think that there has been a huge amount of, of work to think about the quality of early learning programs, the quality of preschool programs in particular. Uh, and yet, I think we need to probably look at how we can use federal policy to extend that thinking about high quality preschool to support high quality kindergarten through third grade programs. We have ways of looking at the environment of teacher-child interaction, and we use that a lot for preschool. It could be very good federal policy to think through talking about high quality as we talk about the work of kindergarten to third grade also. And of course, one of the great efforts of the, of the government is to support research on the elements of effective practice. And certainly, as we think about this P3 work, it is tremendously important that we have some data that says it is effective, that something happens. Either we have stronger outcomes for children or whatever our goals are, that there is research that can support it. I think at the federal level to figure out what are the most effective elements, the most important elements for good, sound programs. So there's a lot of federal policy, and you all can probably think of other things that are there, but I think at the federal level there is work to be done and, and, and existing work that can, really can support this effort. And I think this is a, a really important time at which the government is, is very open to looking at this, this area of preschool to third grade. Next slide. At the state level, uh, Vincent has talked about you know, the, the New Jersey structure in which there is uh, a division of early childhood with responsibility for preschool to third grade. That is an important governance structure that states can really think about, uh, and it, it makes life a little easier. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it certainly makes life a little easier to have that structure in place. Also, states have credentialing authority. And the notion of a P3 teacher credential is a real commitment to a state, and it, it really has an impact on how university programs will be structured. But it also speaks to the continuum in terms of the training that you want for teachers and the commitment that the state is making. Uh, an alignment of preschool and K-12 standards I think is really important for states to, to think through. And this is not just putting them together. Uh, if Vincent remembers when uh, New Jersey decided to align their preschool and K-12 standards, it was not an easy task. It's not simply a matching task. It really means folks coming together and thinking about what their goals are. And sometimes groups of folks who've never spoken together really have to come together and think about it. But to have one set of standards that really is preschool to 12, in this case we're looking specifically at preschool to grade three, I think is an important way in which a state can start to structure its work. Greater opportunities for professional development for teachers across this P3 continuum. It's very easy to have professional development thrown around, but to have a focused and really clear notion that these groups of teachers from preschool to third grade need to come together with whatever the resources the state has to really think about how they, they bridge this continuum is, is really important and I think can be very effective. And again, data on the effectiveness of programs. You know, it, it's, it's often the case that states will fund preschool programs but not fund evaluation of those programs. And then when one wants to continue a program and sustain it, there are no data to say whether or not it's been effective. I think this is an important piece of the work that states need to think through in their policy, that they fund preschool programs, they fund their preschool to three work, but they also have to think about the ways in which they support important data gathering that will give them the information they need to make more effective policy across this continuum. So I think states have a big role to play in how they structure themselves, how they use their credentialing authority, how they really start to look at the standards. Only the states have responsibility for curriculum and standards, and how they talk about that and structure it is really an important way to sustain the work. Always budget, uh, but aside from budget, this notion of really having preschool to third grade as a kind of structure and a way of thinking for the state, and that means for districts and, uh, and schools is, is 
is really support, important in continuing the work. The next slide. Uh, the next slide is, is interesting. Higher education, and, and I think that both the federal and state can, uh, governments can support policies to really strengthen higher education in this regard. Uh, across the country, there is huge concern about the quality of teacher and administrator preparation. But certainly in the area of early childhood, there is real concern about improving that quality. And as states and, and the federal government think through the ways in which they will support teacher preparation and administrator preparation, we need to think about what it means to prepare folks for working with children from preschool to third grade. It is, it is easy to have a, a notion of a credential that I mentioned earlier, but it's really important that that credential really prepare folks across the continuum. Uh, sometimes you'll have a P3 credential, but basically the higher education programs have really prepared folks for one thing, for either the preschool program that's getting stronger or for maybe for kindergarten or for higher grades. What we need to support uh, in higher ed to do is to really revamp their curriculum, um, sort of really support an increase in stronger staffing for higher ed so that teachers can come out of these programs with the skills and abilities and dispositions they need to really support children preschool all the way to third grade. And I think that would be tremendous strengthening of our teacher preparation and programs across the country. And advocates. Vincent mentioned uh, the advocacy groups that are working with the folks in New Jersey. And I think that across the country, we've seen advocates really stepping up to this work. And so I would, I would ask that the advocates really think about all of the state and federal policies that they see and go out there and support this kind of alignment, support opportunities for alignment when they may not be explicit. Uh, there may be simply opportunities embedded in programs, but to go out and really see if there are ways in which they can, they can make this work. It is important work and, and it cannot be done by just the state and the federal government alone, uh, I think the advocates have a huge role. So this was a very fast overview, but again, I think policy work is going to be critical as we move early childhood programs that are preschool focused along, but also as we think about the fact that no preschool program alone is going to guarantee success at the end of third grade or grade 12. That we need to have policies at the federal and state level that really are going to support that entire continuum. So if you think about the role of kindergarten, uh, I am so proud to hear that folks are thinking of ways in which to improve the quality of kindergarten programs. This is often um, a sort of unattended grade where nobody really has much responsibility for it. But to see kindergarten as a critical piece of that continuum, to see first and second grade as, as really critical is important. So again, federal levers that are, we have some existing ones, but I think supporting the quality uh, of programs across the continuum, supporting research and elements of effective programs, and the state looking at its own structure, its own credentials, gathering data, and then really looking at the ways in which we can find both federal and, and state support to increase the quality of higher education programs for teachers and administrators will do a great deal to support this work and to get much better outcomes for children. Christy? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. And it's uh, such a privilege to be able to have sort of the depth of your um, experience and perspective, um, given all that you have done uh, for, for this country of, over the last several years. So thank you very much. Um, two of the key takeaways, I think, from um, Jacqueline's remarks are that we can't really tease apart this policy change from partnerships and professional development. She laid out some really key sort of incentives in existing policy efforts and um, policy endeavors um, that really can leverage and incentivize partnerships and really push on professional development. So we need to see those three Ps as really intertwined, um, that they impact one another in multiple ways. And then the addition that she added that I think is really important is this role of higher education. 
both in terms of preparation and then the role that to, can be and should be continued to be played in research and evaluation. Um, and so I want to add just a few more comments on policy before we get to um, a handful of questions uh, for the panelists. One of the things that I often think about um, in this policy work is that we tend to get stuck in thinking about fixed policy or those hard policies that really are statutory changes, rules and regulations changes, things that require some sort of legislative body to endorse. When really there are a lot of more, um, what in the literature are called flexible policies, um, that are the, the guidance, the, um, the um, in, informing rules and regulations that can be set by um, states, agencies, uh, school districts, central offices, and others. It's, it's the guidance that's provided to really help implement. Um, and so I think if you uh, go back to how we defined scale and sustainability at the beginning of this, that it's not just about um, uh, spreading to broader geographic regions, but really spreading vision, spreading motives, creating shared language, shared understanding, shared vocabulary, that we need to be thinking a lot more about these flexible policies. Um, one concrete example of that is around Title I. For a very long time, people believed that Title I could not be used for preschool programs, when indeed the policy itself said it was okay, but there was just this prevalent belief that it was not okay. As soon as some bold policymakers in state agencies and other places started providing some informed guidance saying it is okay, you can use dollars these, way, these ways, there has been an increased use of Title I to fund preschool programs and to focus on alignment. No hard policy change was needed. It was simply somebody needing to step out and providing some guidance on um, what was already on the book. Uh, that said, and um, what I really wanted to spend a few minutes talking about is existing policy trains that are moving right now. Um, I think when we think about P3 or pre-K through third policy, it's not necessarily new policies that need to be created, but rather getting on some policy trains that are already moving and being sure that there is a P3 perspective um, being integrated. So for example, um, all states have one or more of these kinds of governing bodies, early childhood advisory councils, state boards of education, then of course there's local boards of education, local city councils. To what extent do they embrace P3? Do they have committees and spokespeople that really speak out for this specific age continuum from preschool through third grade? If not, how can we be infiltrating um, their ranks and really making this part of their common knowledge, their vocabulary, and their priorities. A second, um, all states are really focused on creating new evaluation systems for teachers and principals. Um, and to what extent are we infusing a P3 perspective in that? How can we measure student growth in those early grades, in kindergarten, first, and second grade? They're untested years. How, what, is, what are responsible ways to be thinking about teacher performance? How do we think about what's unique about the role of elementary school principals in supporting this work? And how can we be infusing into the state mandated evaluation systems for those teachers and principals a really explicit focus on the P3 years? Um, Common Core State Standards, those have come up um, a bit. I'm glad Jacqueline addressed these in terms of thinking about not just a connect the dot approach to Common Core and existing state early learning standards, but really being intentional about creating um, meaningful alignment, which also could include ensuring that states have K-3 standards for social and emotional development, for approaches to learning, since Common Core only focuses on um, reading and math, how can we be pushing up some of the values of early learning standards into the K-3 years? And then this has also been mentioned um, a couple of times, but it's worth a second mention, is that the Common Core state standards were written on the premise that every child gets full day kindergarten. 
and yet we know that not every child is getting a full day of kindergarten. So how can we be ensuring that that kindergarten year, where some children are getting two and a half hours of instruction per day and others are getting six or seven hours of instruction per day, and yet all of those kindergarten students are going to be expected to reach common core standards, how can we be addressing that and make sure that children are not getting shortchanged and teachers aren't going crazy um, in half-day kindergarten classrooms? Um, other trains that are moving that I think are important to think about, um, QRIS systems, quality rating and improvement systems. This is common speak in the early childhood world, but I have to say not a lot of superintendents or school principals have any idea what a QRIS is or why they should care about it. Where if you think about Kimberly's and Lynn's comments about preparedness, schools should really care if children are entering their kindergarten classrooms coming from high quality programs or low quality programs. They should also know who those uh, early learning programs are so that they can connect with them and build these partnerships. So beginning to integrate the QRIS speak and values into the K-12 world I think is very important. Similarly, KEAs or kindergarten entry assessments are really important. And those are happening in the kindergarten year, but how are we ensuring that our early learning partners are engaged in that process and that our early learning partners are feeling um, included in decision making around um, kindergarten entry assessments? They're not seeing this as a judgment or evaluation of their performance, but really a way that they can know how they can get better, how they can improve, and how they can more closely partner with not just kindergarten teachers, but elementary schools. State longitudinal data systems, also a train that is moving quickly in most states. But do we have really strong early childhood and early elementary voices at those data planning tables to ensure that the longitudinal data systems are including, yes, state-funded pre-K, but also child care and Head Start and early Head Start and a full array of data that will help paint the picture of the kinds of programs and services that our youngest children are receiving. And then other policy considerations would include thinking about transitions. Um, I just learned of a new policy statement adopted by a board of, uh, local board of education in California yesterday around transition that um, schools in that school district are now um, required to have some formal transition practices in place to know where children are coming from and to have partnerships with those providers. So how can we be thinking about putting transition practices um, into policy? How can we be thinking about family engagement in policy? And again, this links back to some of the other moving trains. Should family engagement be part of principal evaluation systems, of teacher evaluation systems? Should it be a more embedded part of certification for teachers or elementary school principals? How can we start embedding these really important values of P3 work into existing policy infrastructure? So I am now going to um, turn to some of the questions that were raised, and I'm going to pose them to all of the speakers. Um, so Kimberly, Lynn, Vincent, Jacqueline, all feel free to um, jump in. Um, one of the first questions, I think, is this notion of funding sustainability. Kimberly and Lynn and Vincent in particular, you all mentioned private funders that have made this work possible. How do you see or what do you see being the long-term financial sustainability or funding sustainability for your work? In every school district, we are looking at the fact that some of the funding will end this year and have recently shared that information with the board along with specific information about what will be necessary to sustain the various components of the pre-K-3 effort and to ask them to consider that the impact of those and to uh, prioritize that in terms of their budget decision making. So it's moving into the uh, basic education the funding and use of, of categorical uh, funds. Uh, away from just the grant funding? I would say there's um, a few things that um, have helped being part of the coalition. One was doing the jump starts and using those funds to kind of ignite some passion around that 
and then having folks in our own district in the title department and the finance department get excited and say, great, how can we fund that for more schools, if not all schools, for next year? So that we're taking the piece of what we, what we received from private funders and then putting it into our system. I think in New Jersey, we've, um, uh, as I mentioned, for the first three years, uh, we were funded through um, Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Uh, who had a grant from FCD um, that went away this year. So that changed our dynamic a little bit. Um, in our partnership with ASCD, uh, we're actually charging uh, district teams a nominal fee to attend um, the um, leadership series and the seminar as well as the conference. And in comparison to other things that they do, it, it truly is uh, a nominal fee. But again, for, uh, for, for me, it really puts so much on um, you know, on the local level. Yes, we can continue professional development initiatives, but then when work continues in districts, which is really where it needs to work, and I think where, um, you know, I've referenced the move to full-day kindergarten, uh, which is now in New Jersey, which is not mandated. Um, uh, attendance is not even mandated, uh, certainly in New Jersey. Um, uh, that 76% do have full-day kindergarten. Uh, and again, that's a testament to local leaders taking it, like superintendents taking it upon themselves, uh, and and having me and people from my office go out and talk about um, the importance of initiatives like full day K, preschool to third grade alignment. So you know, it looks like funding for these initiatives might not be um, as prevalent as it as it was. However, um, you know, we we are using funds that we have to make sure the professional development happens. And districts are using funding in ways, uh, in different ways, to make sure that these important initiatives happen. Jacqueline, I don't know if you have anything you want to weigh in on. Yeah, you know, I think in the best of all possible worlds, this work would become just a part of the way that a district does business. Uh, I think we need continued funding to, as someone said, to jumpstart these efforts. But it would be tremendously important if, certainly if the state supported this in some way, but if the districts really saw this as simply the way in which they, they worked um, and, and it wasn't an extraordinary thing. There is professional development money. There is always a way of making sure that, that you, know, you leverage the funds you can. And I think also looking at those funding sources, it, you know, it, it might be that looking again, as you mentioned, at Title I funding to see how you can really allocate that and dedicating a bigger chunk of that to P3 could be a way that, that districts could, could really support some of the, the work in an ongoing way. And actually, Christy, if, 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 uh, if I could, I, I mean, a, a number of the uh, initiatives that we talk about or these components of a preschool through third grade system do not cost money. Paying attention to um, uh, particular transition practices do not cost extra money. Knowing, putting on your kindergarten registration a question about uh, attendance for preschool or uh, homeschool or family child care, uh, knowing something about where families and children spent their time before they came to your district is not a move that costs any money. But yet, if you're a district that wants to communicate with families better uh, from a school board perspective, a district perspective, a community relations perspective, um, it's something that is doable, doesn't cost money, and could have very big impact. So wh while it would be great to have lots of money to do a whole bunch of other things like we're doing in states, you know, it needs to be clear, too, that there certainly are things that do not cost money to do. Great. So um, another question that came in was um, around partnerships, and if any of you are or have ideas about partnerships with social services or support services sort of extending beyond the education sector to be thinking about um, some of this uh, alignment work, and I know um, at least partially, this could include child care and family child care. Vincent, you just touched on that. But if, if Jacqueline, this might be something you want to weigh in on, too, given the federal work group that's really right. trying to look across service sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to start? <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, I don't think any of the work can be done 
in in isolation. And so the partnerships are tremendously important. I, I, from the from the federal perspective and a policy perspective, what you want to do is leverage all of the resources. And I think as you look at the social service agencies, there are, there's often funding there that will help support some of this work. Certainly, as you mentioned, child care. Uh, you know, child care goes from birth to, I think it's to age 13. There's there, there are monies there. I think there are ways in which you want to align a lot of the the sort of health and social service issues for, for kids in high quality programs with these these non education agencies. So I think there you should see them as partnerships. It's not always easy. There are lots of regulations, uh, state, federal, local regulations that often kind of keep things from happening smoothly. But I think it's important to look beyond and uh, and across these agencies for um, the same kinds of indicators of quality as well and, and professional development and, and looking at funding that can go across all, all the sectors. We, uh, in Seattle Public Schools, we've been lucky to be uh, partners with the City of Seattle um, and in the last two years have uh, piloted a um, coalition for holistic education in order to really reach out to practitioners, preschool, uh, child care providers, kindergarten teachers, we meet about every six weeks and, and talk about these things. Um, it's the beginning, um, but like you were saying, Jacqueline, it, we can't do it in isolation. So how do we really leverage those partnerships to do what's best for kids? You know, I just wanted to, to jump back in here. And this comes from the experience at the federal level of, of working on the Early Learning Challenge Fund, a uh, challenge competition. There was a, a an initial piece in that work, the, the application, which folks had to think through at the state level how they were spending all of their early learning resources. How, what's our commitment? What are we doing across the state? It pulled together all the sectors and, and perhaps at, uh, at, a, at a district level. It's a, it's a good opportunity to think about doing that same kind of thing. What are all the early learning sectors? How are we using our resources? Get the big picture of that landscape and then see how the partnerships can really build. Great. Which I'll just, I want to quickly jump in. There was also a question if P3 is the same as pre K through third, and where does prenatal fit into this? And so I just want to quickly address this in that I think most of us think about the P as being programs and services that children experience before school, pre-school, there's the P, which means it can be variable depending on who you are and which partners are at the table right now. It could just be state pre-K, and so it really is a pre-K through third partnership. Others where they've gotten a little deeper into their collaborative work might be including Head Start, child care, family child care, so there's a richer perspective of P. And yet other sites are also including early Head Start infant toddler providers and prenatal providers. So I think it really depends on, it varies from location to location, um, who's at the table. The issues of alignment, collaboration, sharing resources, creating common vocabulary are the same. Um, it's just the, the number and diversity of partners at the table. Um, another question came in around, and um, Jacqueline started to um, hint at this, is that it feels like a lot of the work right now is still heavily lodged on pre-K and kindergarten. And so the question was, how is this work beginning to push up into grades one, two, and three and really change the instructional practices in those classrooms? So with our uh, professional development in- This is Kimberly in Seattle. In Seattle, we um, have been working on a professional development uh, plan. It's a five-year plan. We're in year four. And this year, we have rolled up uh, to fourth and fifth grade. Um, and we're working primarily with uh, our 19 full day K state-funded schools. And we have worked in cohorts. So we have five different cohorts this year. And the initial cohorts were pre-K, K, and first grade. So working to talk about instructional strategies and um, content, mostly in balanced literacy, 
um, so that we have a common vocabulary. In the last couple of years, we've been able to move into second and third grade. And then this year, we have been uh, able to offer two demonstration sites in two schools, one in the north end, one in the south end, where we can bring in new pre-K, K, and first grade teachers to observe actual practice while it's happening in kindergarten, first grade, pre-K, second grade. One of the things we are doing in uh, Everett and Snohomish County is to do joint professional development around early literacy from pre-K through first grade with a few second grade teachers involved. And in this professional development, we are uh, going to each other's sites so that we are observing in each other's classrooms and we're observing a consultant doing literacy uh, um, modeling and working on developing common vocabulary and assessments um, across pre-K into second and third grade. I think to me, it's, I do, it's a, um, a great observation um, and I think um, in part, part of the answer is that the certainly K focus has been for good reason. Kindergarten has been in an absolute purgatory for a number of years now. Uh, and there's a lot that we need to do to support people who are um, uh, teaching and children who are, are there. You know, with that said, uh, it you know I think like Jacqueline had mentioned, you know, um, preschool is not a silver bullet. A good kindergarten program is not a silver bullet. Uh, and we need to think about what the experiences are um, for children, certainly beyond preschool and kindergarten. And I think the issues that districts struggle with and 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 work with. Um, kind of present the opportunity there. I work with so many districts that talk about, you know, we noticed on our, our third grade assessment that our children are having difficulty struggling with um, you know, open-ended responses, for instance, or, or nonfiction text, which of course is a big uh, topic with Common Core. Well, okay, those are great things to start with. What is, if that's what you're seeing in third grade, what do the practices look like in second grade that would help to support um, those things going on? Um, Christy, you asked about school board involvement, then of course the next question would be, okay, well in what way are we funding professional development programs for teachers, perhaps materials for classrooms that would get at that issue in third grade to make sure that we're seeing uh, sustainable practices in second grade? And then what does it look like in first grade, in kindergarten? And I think if you use, um, you know, data that you're seeing throughout the preschool third grade continuum, especially at the end of third grade because that's on the minds of a lot of people. Um, I think that's a good starting point to say, okay, well, what are the practices that need to go on backwards in a backwards kind of design way, if you will, um, that, um, uh, that can address uh, practices throughout the continuum. Great. Jacqueline, did you want to weigh in? No, I'm good. Okay. Good. Well, we are coming to the um, end of this webinar, and as I alluded to at the beginning, um, this is the last of our eight-part webinar series, but we, um, the collaborative group of partners who are the Pre-K through Third National Work Group, want to keep doing something. So in order to help us think through might, what might be most useful, we have three polling questions that we would love to um, for you to respond to. The first one is related to the content of, um, of the information that would be most interesting to you in the field. Would you like to hear more case studies, sort of real life um, stories of work that's on the ground? Would you like to dig more deeply into content specific areas? What does literacy or math or STEM or assessment, what does what do those sort of content specific areas look like pre-K to third grade? Would you like some summaries of relevant research that exists? Um, would you like to have more interaction with experts in the field? We realize interaction is limited on these webinars, so would you like to find ways to have deeper conversation with experts? We're asking you to just pick your one most favorite um, uh, just to help us think through next steps. So we'll give you about five or six more seconds on this one. And then we'll close the poll and move, we'll see what you all think momentarily. Does the magic wizard count votes on our end? 
And while the counting is being done, I should also say that we are an all-volunteer group. We actually do not have funders that underwrite our work. We all do it because we care deeply about um, this work and think that we can together share lots of good information. So it looks like on-the-ground stories are most intriguing with some relative research right behind it. So the second question then is um, more focused on in a moment, I don't remember off the top of my head, it's more focused on sort of the level of work. Um, we've tried to make explicit that we know that this alignment work is going on at many levels, at the school level, at the district level, at the state level, at the federal level, and then there's issues that are cut across all levels. Is there a particular level that you are most interested in hearing about? Or do you prefer to keep the focus sort of at this across all levels and trying to tease apart what are some of the common issues that might transcend each of these levels. So while you're noting your top preference for this, I will just acknowledge the partners who are in the pre-K through third grade um, national working group. Um, we have the University of Washington um, represented by me, Sharon Ritchie at first school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Jana Fleming at the Erickson Institute in Chicago. Bridget Hamry, who is with the University of Virginia and helped to develop the class assessment. Um, uh, Mimi Howard, who was a National Head Start Fellow. Lisa Guernsey at the New America Foundation. Tanja Rucker with National League of Cities. And Tom Schultz at the Council of Chief State School Officers. So it looks like the primary interest is continuing to do across levels with some mixed preference around state and district or community level. And then our last question before we close for the day is more around the delivery mode. If webinars is the um, is a preferred venue or if there might be other um, modes of content delivery. And here you can check all that apply. Um, you don't have to just pick one. Those that you think would be most useful to you. So we have webinars, electronic prints, so newsletters or e-newsletters e or um, sort of white papers that came out electronically, face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we've considered um, pulling together something like that or a national P3 conference. Um, Web-based interactions, so again, web-based but more interactions would need to be chat rooms or much more interactive webinars where the audience can participate more. Um, or video lectures and presentations. Uh, and so while you are answering that last question, I also want to acknowledge that the technology, the actual webinar platform, was generously supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's literally the only funding we've gotten for this work, and so we're very grateful for them for making this happen. So let's see this last answer, and you want it all. Of course you do. <laughs> so a little bit of everything. Um, that's actually good um, feedback, and I hope you will all stay tuned both through the National Pre-K through Third Listserv, the New America Foundation Early Education blog. We will be announcing sort of next steps um, in the next few um, months about what we um, what we want to accomplish uh, together. Then, um, as a final reminder, all eight webinars. Um, will be archived on our website. There's the address. Um, the slide deck for the first seven are up. We're still working on getting videos up, but um, the history of our work to date can be found here. So on behalf of um, myself and all of our partners, thank you for listening and thank you to Kimberly, Lynn, Vincent, and Jacqueline for your really wise insights today. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Christy. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.